our 15th Pan Asia Farmers Exchange Program. It's one o'clock. So we would like to start our program. And uh, I already said welcome, but maybe I should say good afternoon as well, or good morning, or wherever you come from the other parts of the world. Uh, you're all welcome. And we greet you uh, to have a good day, good afternoon with us uh, for today's program. And uh, before that, may I invite everyone to please stand for the Philippine National Anthem. Mm. You may all sit down. Thank you very much. And so, as I said, this is our first day of our 15th Pan Asia Farmers Exchange Program. So, how many days we are we are going to have this program? It will be five a five-day program. So, from Monday to Friday. So, it will be from October 18 to 22. And who is this beautiful lady in your front? This is Sonny Tobaba. I'm your moderator for today. I am the Biotechnology Affairs Director of CropLife Asia. I would like to welcome all the... Did we lose Sunny? I think so. Yes, yeah, Sunny is yeah. here now. Okay. Hi, Kasani, are you back? Hi, Kasani, are you back? Sorry, I got disconnected. Technology, technology. So, I would just like to restart by introducing myself as your moderator for today. I am Sonny Tababa, the Biotechnology Affairs Director of CropLife Asia. I would like to welcome all, all our participants. We have more than 120 participants already who have registered and they all, some of them come from Korea. We have uh, participants from uh, China, we have from Thailand, we have from Vietnam, and of course, we have many participants from all over the Philippines, so many provinces, especially from the academe of the Philippines. Thank you for joining us today. So we have prepared a good program ahead of us. I hope you will find that very useful. And we have also different uh, uh, we have experts from different countries and different fields. And we also have model farmers who are joining us uh, sometime this week, 
who will share their best practices, experiences, and challenges in farming. And uh, before that, I would just like, we have Vietnamese participants who are with us today. So for our Vietnamese participants, you could see the icon uh, interpretation below your screen and please choose Japanese. And then you can see that it is being interpreted into Vietnamese. Again, uh, please choose Japanese as the language uh, to hear the Vietnamese interpretation. So let's get the webinar going. We proceed to the welcome remarks. So that will be delivered to us first by uh, CropLife Asia's Executive Director. But before giving the floor to you, Xiang He, let me just uh, introduce CropLife Asia first as the Asian operation of the International Plant Science Industry Association, which is CropLife International based in Brussels. Uh, Xiang He, our speaker, our speaker today, uh, earned his Master of Science in Genetic Engineering from University Putra, Malaysia, and PhD in Molecular Biology, Plant Virus from Okayama, Okayama University in Japan. Uh, professional recognition includes a silver award at the 2005 Geneva International Exhibitions and Inventions of New Techniques and Products. It is a US, he is also a US, go, US government Cochrane Fellowship recipient for biological research at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio and UPM awards for research and development. Without much ado, may I call on Shang He. Shang He, you have the floor. Thank you, Katani, for the kind introduction. Um, I Again, a welcome to the 15th Pan-Asian Farmer Exchange Program 2021. Good afternoon to all the delegates. Uh, Sir Ed, thank you for making this possible. Dr. Abe from BCT, Ms. Veronica from FMC, and of course, not to forget Dr. Ola. And to all the delegates and also upcoming speakers, welcome and thank you for supporting this program. This annual program, we bring different stakeholders from different countries with different experience to share, especially with the use of technology, just like crop biotech, and corn, especially in the Philippines. We have just celebrated the 18th year of adopting biotech crop, which started way back in 2003. I wish we could be here today in the Philippines to show you the tech, amazing technology in person to see how farmers have benefited of this technology for the last, ten, uh, last decade. Unfortunately, the world is still in the face of moving into living with the virus state and it will be seen probably hopefully by next year we'll see more travel relaxation and can we can uh, bring everyone back to the philippines to look at how the benefit the technology has been deployed and utilized and just before we move on just like medical field the farmers are the frontiers are the frontliners the hero tribute and a shout out to all the farmers here because together during this COVID period, we have managed to avert another crisis, a food security crisis. You know, we were still able to go out to the farm, plant the seeds and continue to produce throughout the COVID season to ensure safe and secure nutritious food throughout all our stakeholders in many countries across Asia Pacific. However, there's also a sad part of it during the SOFI report that uh, was published uh, recently, more than half the world undernourished still lives in Asia, 418 million and there are still a lot of number of people uh, unable to access adequate food rose uh, by 320 million. We're going to see a bit more data coming in once we finish or we complete the 2020 data and 2021 during this pro period. But again, we are also very lucky to, 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 in a sense that many governments quickly stepped in and interject, interjected or injected various stimulus package to support the agriculture phase last year. And like, for example, in the, in the Philippines, we had that green pass to enable transportation of food producers and go to market that we pivoted over to e-commerce. But nevertheless, we all look for one key in, in material, the input side. We only can have successful agriculture when we have good inputs, starting from the seeds, starting from the soil itself. So 
last couple of weeks, we you know we are also happy to celebrate World Food Day last um, on Sunday. And two weeks ago, we finished the Food Systems Summit. All it gears to is looking how can we transform agriculture or the food system transformation to achieve sustainable goal by 2020. And all of this needs agriculture biotechnology. It's a center and pivot tool to for transforming a global sorry global food uh, system to meet the zero hunger goal by 2030. And with that, we also have climate anxiety. And most of us, you know, you look at where Philippines has uh, gone through a recent typhoon and there are a lot of crop losses. But between that, there are a lot of technologies that are already ready, already um, in the market and in the pipeline that we can put into the market. And for example, DuPont Pioneer's waxy corn that allows higher amylopectin production, powdery mildew resistance in wheat, uh, reducing trans of soil or uh, longer shelf life of tomato. All of these are the newer generation. You know, when you look at mobile phone, you look at upgrading of the mobile phone, including the pump flying technology, our member companies that we represent continue to invest 3.5 billion US dollar every year to ensure that our value chain, our um, pipeline continues to enhance and utilizing newer technology from the, the biotech crop that you usually know from uh, stacks that you be having in a market. We'll hear more of this, but moving into plant breeding innovation. So in order for us, the, the farmers to be able to be able to enjoy and get their hands into this advanced technology, we need to work very closely with government stakeholders and farmers like you to ensure that we have effective policy and laws and regulation must be developed and implemented to ensure timely delivery of this technology. We have seen years of safety data. 64 nations and territories have approved the import and use of 677 genetic modified products. And through years, we have the experience and safety data to assure both consumer society at large. So this is my summary. At the end of the core of our current work, poverty reduction, food security, improved nutrition lies in creating the ent an environment that would need a company knowledge that can be used to facilitate and transform the agriculture food system with system. And therefore by having the good genetics, good inputs through biotechnology and et cetera, to help farmers to be able to cope with adaptation and bio adaptation and mitigation. Plant science industry have a series of toolbox of technology and will continue to develop technology that are ready to shape and fit into the future food system to support farmers in the transformation towards a sustainable agriculture food system. With that, Sunny, a short re opening remarks for you. And I wish everybody a good week ahead and hopefully you'll bring some good um, experience that we can share with our national regulators to further and enable our farmers to have the technology into their hands as soon as possible. Thank you, Kasani. Thank you very much, Shanghi, for that very thoughtful message of how important agriculture is and how we continue to, uh, to live actually in this planet because agriculture has helped us through even during COVID times and how important it is that genetics, everything starts with good inputs and it, how important is good genetics is so that everything like whether, whether to address climate change, for example, or higher yield starts with uh, good genetics. Thank you so much, Shanghe. And also to welcome us uh, today is the president of CropLife Philippines and the country business manager of FMC Agro Philippines, Ms. Veronica Tiborcio. Uh, Mambeng, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sunny. I hope you can hear me well. Can, can I uh, request if I can uh, be heard by everyone? Yep, you're uh, loud and clear, yes. Mambeng. Yes, we can Thank hear you, you very Thank well. You. <laughs> Again, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Magandang Ali. This means good harvest. Today, all of us will definitely have a five-day session that will give us a good harvest. A good harvest of new knowledge, additional network, new technology, and of course, a great experience. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. I believe that we have a diverse participant from different Asian countries like Singapore, Japan, Korea, China, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines. 
I hope that I was able to name all. So a piece of advice, if you wanted to learn, you need to do your best to empty your cup and give your 100% attention and participation in today's session. So we um, definitely uh, can assure you that you will learn a lot of things today and until Friday. So we are very fortunate that amid pandemic, can still gather online and make ourselves productive. If you believe the same, how about a virtual raise hand? <laughs> I'll do it also. I'll raise my hand here. Okay, good, good. <laughs> See those hands, very good. So we are very fortunate to have this uh, session. Again, thank you so much for, for joining us. As shang -Hi mentioned during his opening, emphasizing the importance of sustainable agriculture for food security. Millions of people are highly dependent to agricultural produce. So we also need to take actions to transform food system, capitalize on innovations and advanced technologies, as he mentioned, while of course looking on how we can help to prevent climate change related issues. So Crop Life Asia, Crop Life Philippines and the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines started collaboration in implementing the Farmers Exchange Program. This program, this started since 2007 and now on its 15th year. So let's give a round of applause to all of the people who are making this um, possible. Rest assured that Crop Life will continue to develop programs that will support our growers for a better agricultural industry. So the Philippines is actually the first country that planted biotech corn, known as BT corn in 2003, which is resistant to the dreaded Asian corn borer. At that time, since it's still new, there was much of misunderstanding, miscommunications, questions about this technology. So however, as time goes by, we see how it was helped millions of farmers and of course, uh, consumers, right? However, um, this is something that uh, we cannot ignore. So that's why Crop Life and the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines helps by creating a support platform, this Farmers Exchange Program. So in this program, you would hear from experts, of exciting developments in crop biotechnology, the value of science communication, learning from our biotech crop growers, and even the growers themselves. And there will be a lot more in store for you. So again, in behalf of Crop Life Philippines, Crop Life Asia, thank you for joining. Looking forward to e-meet all of you in this five-day program. Um, another request is to please Help us to talk about plant science technology with your family, friends, and colleagues. So everyone, again, stay tuned and stay safe. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you very much, Mom Beng. This is a very inspiring message for everyone. And I'm sure we now have 174 attendees, and they're all, all listening to you, ma'am. And... Uh, keeping our fingers crossed to meet those challenges and be able to be part of that community to talk and you know, explain better plant science technology to our family, friends, and colleagues. Thank you so much, Mam Beng. All right, so uh, before I introduce our first speaker, just some house rules. Okay, so you would see at the bottom of your screen the Q&A function. So the Q&A function, uh, please type your questions in that function, <laughs> the Q&A section. Then questions will be answered. Uh, so every after the speaker completed the talk, we have a Q&A. So if there are questions, we, we will ask our speaker to answer those. And if we are not able to answer all the questions, we will try our best to answer that via uh, here or via email. And many of you have been asking about the e-certificate. So we will give e-certificates for those who will be able to attend a five-day uh, 
the five day session. So until Friday, and that will be uh, sent via email to your registered email address. And well, this might be a surprise to everyone, but we just would like also to make uh, to have fun. So every day uh, at the end, before we end our session, we ask a quiz. There is a quiz, one question, and the first three who will who we who we see as giving the correct answers, you will receive a US twenty dollar uh, question. So. Don't go away. <laughs> okay, so moving on to our first speaker. Let me introduce first. Our first speaker is the director of Southeast Asian Center and director of the Global Knowledge Center on Crop Biotechnology of the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications, or we call it ISAA, others call it ISAAA. She leads the development and publication of the annual global status of the commercialized biotech slash GM crops or the ISA briefs. She has published 31 papers in scientific journals and proceedings, very prolific, and chapters in two books of biotechnology. She holds a PhD in botany from Purdue University, Indiana, USA, and postdoctoral fellowship at Albert Ludwigs University, Freiburg, I hope you pronounce that right, Germany. And guess what? That's on golden rice. Today, she will give us an overview of modern biotechnology, which includes its adoption status and products in the pipeline. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rodora Romero Aldamita. Dr. Ola, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm, it's evening, my time. I'm here in California. So it's very nice to be a part again of uh, this uh, Pan Asia Farmers Exchange. Uh, since Sony started uh, conducting this one, I think I haven't missed any any forum. I always was the first speaker uh, because of uh, the overview on GM crops. So with that, I'd like to share my screen. Or is that? Okay. Uh, okay, slideshow. Leave them start. Okay. So this uh, is the, let me, okay. Yeah, so my topic is the overview of biotechnology and GMOs. I, when I started my PhD, well, when I was still at Erie, we have been uh, developing, trying to develop biotech crops, biotech rice, and uh, currently biotech crop or GM crops are synonymous. So when I, when I mentioned biotech and GM, it's, it's interchangeably used at this presentation. So currently, uh, this is now the uh, accepted definition of biotechnology. It's any technique that uses whole or part of a living thing to make new products, improve or develop plants, animals, and other organisms for specific use. So I would highlight it could be a whole or a part of a living thing and its use for improvement. So th those are the, the key words that we need to remember. So when we talk about biotechnology, we look at its scope. So first we start with fermentation, biofertilizers. So here we use whole organisms. So we use microorganisms to, to uh, use, <clears throat> to develop fermented products, biofertilizers. But as we go up, to the ladder, we can see that we you, here in plant tissue culture, monoclonal antibody production, we now use parts of those organisms. And as we go up, we see that we use much smaller segments of the um, organism up to the DNA level. So at the same time for animals, that is also happening. So from uh, small, uh, big organisms, so this is now uh, the um, bigger uh, 
or, uh, organs up to the smaller ones where we have genetic engineering of animals. So when we see, when we say biotechnology, we cover from the uh, old or the, the conventional um, biotechnology to the modern biotechnology. But now let's move at what is the basis of biotechnology. Every one of us contains cells or all, all parts of our body contain cells. And within that we have the nucleus, the chromosomes, and then the DNA and the DNA of all organisms are composed of pairings of nucleotides. So this is thymine paired with adenine, guanine pair, paired with cytosine. So even if you're a human being, plant, animal or microorganisms, every one of us contain this sequence and we can only have uniqueness with some types of specific DNA segments to make ourselves unique. So this means that we can have interchanged or we can exchange DNA from one organism to another, which is one of the many ways by which we can develop improvements in our organisms or whatever organisms we desire. So this is the way we do genetic engineering. Uh, we, we, ident we isolate the gene, we put it in a vector. It's in a gene construct now then we introduce it to plant cells. So I'm now using plants as an example, which is rice. And then we can introduce genes through particle bombardment and then through agrobacterium, which is a bacteria which will contain the gene construct. And then uh, the bacteria will allow, uh, will go through the cellular, the cellular mechanism so that the, the DNA can integrate into the nucleus. And then we can have a selection of the callus, regenerate into plants. The plants can be screened in the greenhouse or the greenhouse, tested in the field, in, in one location, and then in multi-location. Now, all of these steps cover regulation. Most of the laboratories establish their, um, their lab or genetic engineering lab with the guidance of the National Committee on Biosafety. So each country should have an oversight on the, on the laboratory first, and then on each part of the development of the biotech crop. And it is very essential that countries which conduct this type of work should undergo or should be covered by regulation in their countries. So as we go forward, we see that there are now different products of biotechnology which have been developed. So we have um, uh, products which will help us in fighting diseases, just like what we have now, fighting COVID-19 through mRNA, which is a, a product of biotech. So we have, uh, you, you already know that Pfizer, Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So this is through biotech. We have increasing yield because we include, include or introduce genes to increase yield of crops, environment-friendly uh, products, safer crops, nutritious food, just like beta-carotene enriched rice, better industry with um, more biomass in crops so that we can use it for biofuels. So all of this has been ongoing for the last um, 25 years. And so this is why we use biotech crops. Because, why? Because we have high global population. Currently in 2020, um, uh, we have, oh, 2020, 2021, we already have 7.9 billion people. And it is estimated that it's going to go up to 9.7 to 10.7 uh, billion. And it needs 70% increase in food production. And that is really immense. And it is a challenge to all our farmers to do this. We also have problems on, on climate change. Uh, accompanying these problems are biotic and abiotic stresses. These are problems which we were not there before when we didn't have the climate change. But now we have new species of diseases, uh, insects that, uh, that affect our crops. And then we also have climate uh, extreme temperatures, um, submergence, or a lot of water, or sometimes no water at all, 
such as drought, which has been affecting some of the countries. Now, all of this, the interplay of high global population and climate change affects uh, food insecurity and undernutrition in low-income countries. And currently, the United Nations has embarked the SDG 2 or Sustainable Development Goal 2, which has the goal of zero hunger by 2030, and it requires biotech applications. And this, these are the reasons why we need biotech crops. So now I'm going to uh, discuss with you what's going on in terms of a GM or biotech crops. So by, uh, this is a data of 2019. We have been uh, looking at the data from 1996. So it looks like it has been going up and by 2019, we had 190.4 million hectares with 105.7 million hectares planted in developing countries and 84.7 million hectares for industrialized countries. So you see that there are now more countries planting by the crops, more developing countries pl uh, uh, planting by the crops because they see the immense benefits that they can get from these crops. And these are now the 29 countries which were recorded to plant by the crops in 2019. So there were 29 and 44% of those and 44.1% also in Latin America and in the North Americas, 10.23 in, uh, in Asia, 1.54 in Africa and two countries or 0.06% in Europe where we have uh, plants only BT cotton, uh, BT corn planted only in Spain and Portugal. Now I'd like to highlight with you the, the new countries which planted by the crops last year. They were Malawi, um, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. So these are very exciting times. And if you have, if you are following our biotech uh, CBU, the crop biotech update, we again have a new uh, country which planted uh, this year in 2021. So as we move forward, let's look at the top five countries which have planted by the crops. So these are US, Brazil, Argentina, Canada, and India. And looking at the adoption rate, you can see that it's near saturation or near 100%. So this shows us that we need more crops, more uh, traits, so that they can reach into, uh, they can expand their areas planted to buy the crops. And it is also interesting to note that there are, there were three developing countries, Brazil, Argentina, and India, who planted by the crops. And uh, they planted these five countries, if you add all of this, they cover 91% of buy the crops in 2019. That's how important these five countries are. So looking at the crops, <clears throat> uh, in North America, they plant more by the crops compared to the other parts or to the other regions of the world. So we have maize, soybeans, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, papaya, squash, potato, and apples. And now here in our parts of the world, Asia and the Pacific, we have cotton planted in India, Pakistan, China, Australia, and Myanmar. Then maize, we have Vietnam and the Philippines, canola, we have it in Australia, eggplant, of course, in Bangladesh, uh, for now, <laughs> sugarcane in, in uh, Indonesia, and safflower in Australia. So you can see the biotech area planted in these parts of the world. In terms of crops, biotech soybean has been planted mostly in uh, uh, in high area, in, in, in greater area. So it's 91.9 million hectares. We have 60.9 biotech maize and then cotton and then canola. So you can see here the fluctuations. These depend on the price, the global price, the, the, um, the climate the, uh, of um, those countries planting these crops. Sometimes if there is too much drought, or there is um, submergence or a lot of water. So it also affects the high and lows 
of these lines. Now, I have highlighted here that Brazil surpassed the U.S. biotech soybean area by 15% in 2019. And uh, this is because um, Brazil is becoming or using much more varieties or more uh, gen uh, genetics. And also, they already have this um, soybean, which has the stock traits in it. And so this is um, a momentous event for, for Brazil because they have surpassed the US in terms of the hectares. Now, globally, uh, we can see that for 32.4 million hectares planted to cotton, 79% is already GM. Uh, for soybean, it's 74% is already GM. So whatever we eat, which is soybean based is already GM. Maize is 31% and canola is 27%. So still, we uh, have a lot of areas to, to consider for planting uh, biotech maize. And in our region, Asia Pacific, we have 17 countries adapting biotech crops. So you see here the nine countries which are planting in green. And then these are now the importing countries. So we, we, we are proud that uh, it's only a few more countries which do not plant us yet. And we hope that they would in the very near future. In terms of traits, we see here that herbicide tolerance used to be the dominant trait from 1996. But then you look at the downhill line here, and then uh, you see the stock traits, which has been going up. And currently in 2019, there are there were more stock traits um, uh, area uh, planted. There is there is a higher area planted to stock traits compared to herbicide tolerance. And of course, the insect resistant one is still uh, going up and down and still at the bottom. So our farmers, you farmers, are learning that the trick that stock traits is better off because you have more um, uh, good traits, good genetics at your hands when you use stock trait varieties. Now, looking at the uh, expanding adoption of biotech food, feed, and crops, the crops that were included in those, the data that I have provided you, all came from um, corn, canola, cotton, and soybean. But now we're looking at new, new crops, new traits, just like uh, non-browning uh, potatoes planted in the U.S. and Canada, non-browning apples in the U.S. Of course, we have Bangladesh planting eggplant, and then the Philippines, we have already an approval of the food, uh, food feed and processing application has been approved. So we're now gearing up the production, the propagation approval. Uh, we have low lignin alfalfa, and then insect resistant sugarcane in Brazil, drought tolerant sugarcane in Indonesia. They have been planting it for the last two years. And high oleic acid in uh, Australia uh, for uh, safflower. And then of course, uh, the very famous pink pineapple in Costa Rica. So with this, we ARISA is following uh, the regulatory approvals in many countries. So if you would like to go and see the ISA.org website, we have the GM approval database and we're recording all of the approved events for the last, from, since 1992. So ha we had uh, 72 countries already issuing approvals with 4,485 approvals in 32 crops, uh, 539 approvals uh, from the US, which has the highest. Maize has the largest number of approved events. And of course, herbicide tolerant maize for um, herb NK603 has the most approval. So if you would like to see the most updated um, record of uh, approvals, you can go to ISA website and look at their specifics. So moving on, we hear, have here the new approvals for cultivation. And these are new traits. These are drought tolerant cotton, low, low gospel cotton, non-browning apple, uh, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in canola, and then of course the multi-insect resistance and herbicide tolerance. So these are the crops that we're following and 
to report the area planted to these crops by the next few years. Now we have some bite crops in the pipeline, the non-browning romaine lettuce, a drought tolerant wheat, Colorado beetle resistant potato, uh, nutrient use efficient and water use efficient and salt tolerant rice being developed in the, um, the US and in Africa. And of course, a very, a very uh, <laughs> the project very close to my heart, of course, is the golden rice where when I was, uh, we started this in 2005 when I was still a postdoc in, in Germany. And now we have already right, the propagation approval. I think our Dr. Russell Reinke is going to talk about that. And then we have the BD eggplant, which is also uh, underway for um, regulatory approval for propagation. So I'm just going to highlight with you the contribution of biotechnology to food security, sustainability, and climate change. And this is a report by Graham Brooks in 2020. So we have increased production, we conserve biodiversity, provide a better environment, reduce carbon dioxide emission, and of course, it helped alleviate poverty and hunger in more than 17 million farmers and 65 million people. So how can we make sure that all of these benefits can be uh, attained or benefited to our farmers? So this is because we need to be diligent, we need to look forward looking, to have forward looking regulatory steps based on science, uh, critically looking at the benefits instead of risks, we should have agricultural productivity with environmental conservation and sustainability. And we have to, uh, to have utmost consideration to millions of hungry and impoverished population. So still our region is being identified as having a lot of problems by FAO with population growth, climate change, agricultural productivity, transboundary pests and diseases, nutrition and health and food losses and waste. So let us still continue on with biotechnology to meet the 50% increase in food demand by 2050. So with that, thank you very much. I'd like you to, I'd like to invite you to come to our website and look at uh, some of the materials that we have uh, coming up or coming from the derivatives of Brief 55 and many other materials for biotechnology, which can help you in your learning process. So thank you very much. And um, I hope you learned something. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Ola. That's a lot of information. Uh, for just a quick reminder for the, those who would like to ask questions, you have a Q&A. Uh, function there at the bottom of your screen. Please type in your questions there and uh, we'll try to answer it uh, within this uh, time limit. And so there, well, I have uh, some questions. So just to remind that this program is also uh, broadcasted, live streamed in Facebook and YouTube. So here's one question from I don't know whether it's a mister or a miss. Pia Wat in Haraha. I have some question. Why this data isn't new update? It's 2019. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much also. Actually, we are, um, the situation as, as with other technologies, we are affected by COVID. It is very difficult to get data for 2020. Uh, we have been trying to put together, but um, some of our contacts were not responding and it's been, um, yeah, it's, it's been hard. And so we, we hope that we can put this together and publish in the next, in next year. So currently uh, when we see, especially some places in Africa, Latin America and some place in, um, you know, in Myanmar, it, it's very difficult currently. So it, it's very, it's hard to get data because of this situation, but I, I already have some of them. So I hope as soon as I complete them, then we'll, we'll publish by next year. Thank you. 
Okay. I know you're interested and exciting to, to see it. <laughs> Everybody will always wait. What's the 2020 report? So we hear that, uh, Dr. Ola, sometime early next year. Yeah. 2020. Here's another question. Uh, I think this is a mom. How soon can we have non-browning apples in the Philippines? That should reduce food waste. And I don't worry that my children don't eat all the apple right away. <laughs> well, it depends on the uh, on the the manufacturer, the developers. You know, when uh, they they have to apply for for marketability here in the Philippines, and there are some, of course, there are some regulations in order to market in the Philippines. We have this. Um, uh, uh, CPB, the Cartagena protocol, the oh, yeah. biosafety protocols that we have to tell them that there is um, that's a GM and so how it, is it going to be accepted in the market in the Philippines? Of course, the developers should also study how it can be marketed. I mean, is it going to be accepted right away or how would the consumers react when they see GM uh, apples in the market. So it's one of those things that uh, our developers should learn, should know before they apply for market uh, release in the Philippines. Okay, so but it'll, very, it'll, very, it'll be very nice if we have it. Yes. <laughs> so these non-browning apples is sold in the U.S. For it to be sold here, you have to get buy a safety permit and all the other uh, factors that Dr. Ola I mentioned before the technology developers could really come in and uh, you will see that in the supermarket. So just one more question. I'm sorry, we'll have to uh, cannot be able to accommodate all the question. We have a question from Normara Salsabila. So the question is, if we maximize land use to plant biotech crops, is it safe for environment or ecosystem balance in future? Yeah, yes. Actually, I, I brushed through the benefits because, uh, because of time limitations. But let me tell you that if we use biotech crops, the amount of production that we get, the, um, uh, the tonnage, the amount of food that we get from biotech crops will not need us to denude our forests or uh, cut down trees or use some other areas for production of crops anymore because that amount already uh, the, through biotech would be enough to feed the people. So that is the way of uh, saving our environment, our ecosystem, because we don't need some other areas, additional areas to produce that much amount of food. Also, we, uh, I have mentioned some of the crops that safer crops because we don't, our farmers will no longer use um, some chemicals that could harm the environment. Uh, frequent use is one of those. So our farmers will get to learn what uh, types of chemicals which can be environment friendly, such as glyphosate, which we are using to, to, to kill the weeds, but then it is not harmful. It, is, it does not go to our environment waters, but it will help us in our agricultural system. So our ecosystem balance is not destroyed. So our environment is safe. Our food is safe. And uh, just like BT eggplant, if we have, uh, well, there are some insect resistant crops, not only eggplant, but also corn. So we don't spray any more insecticide to kill those insects because they already have their inherent, uh, uh, of the introduced genes into them. So that is also very good for farmers who are not, who are no longer going to be exposed to, to hazardous chemicals. So that's food safety, human safety, environment safety, and ecosystem balance. Thank you very much, Dr. Ola. Um, if okay, can you stay on for a while? There are still some questions in the Q&A box. If you could help us answer all those 
the okay. those questions. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, should I answer them live or can I just type them? Uh, in the Q and A, you can just uh, type the answers. Answer them. Okay. Yes. Thank you so okay. much, Doctor. Thank you. Ayala. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, okay. So we move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is a senior scientist and rice breeder, biofortification lead of the Healthier Rice Program of the International Rice Research Institute, or EV. He is from Australia and spent much of his career developing rice varieties for the rice industry in New South Wales and Northern Victoria. As Iris representative in South Korea, he conducted breeding related to research focused on developing varieties suitable for temperate rice production environments. And during this time, he also coordinated the activities of the Temperate Rice Research Consortium. He has a particular interest in developing highly productive varieties while matching grain quality to market requirements. His current focus is making rice more nutritious through biofortification using conventional plant breeding to improve zinc content and transgenic approaches to improve zinc, iron, and vitamin A content in rice. Today, he will talk about the golden rice experience and let us all welcome Dr. Russell Renke. Dr. Russell, you have the floor, please. Thank you, and I just need to choose the screen to share. So I need, need you to confirm that you can both hear me and see the screen that I'm presenting. Confirm. Confirm. Okay, excellent. Confirm. All right. Now, I think we're running a bit behind time, so I'll need to move uh, as quickly as I can through this. But look, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today about agricultural innovation for improved human nutrition and health. And I want to place this in the context of a need to feed a rapidly increasing population to provide not only food security, but also nutritional security to, um, to nourish the human capital of the world. So I'll give you an update on golden rice. Um, but also I want to note that the development of high iron and zinc rice, I would regard of equal importance with golden rice um, because this paves the way for the development of a product that contains all three um, improvements in all three of those micronutrients simultaneously. So, gosh. Sorry, I seem to have gotten this bit out of order. But anyway, this is just the story of the, um, of the, the global population um, increase. Um, and the numbers are quite staggering, really. Um, another 1.2 billion people by 2030, according to whatever population projections that, um, that you look at. Um, and of course, uh, a significant area, a significant number of those, the increase in population will, will occur within Asia. So of course, our CG system, our, which is a network of international agricultural research institutes around the world, it'll maintain its focus on, um, on improving productivity, but we also need to pivot to improving nutrition uh, as a key driver of health and well-being. Um, so food and nutritional security remain uh, very important issues globally in 2021. And you would think that we would have solved many of these problems uh, by now, but unfortunately, there are still 2 billion people suffering from micronutrient malnutrition. And one of the terms that we use to describe this is hidden hunger, because it's not always immediately obvious that people are malnourished. But of course, the lack of these micronutrients has a significant impact because it, um, uh, whilst many people have enough energy for their food, they lack the nutritional balance um, that is required for, for adequate development, but also maintenance of good health. And the current pandemic really underscores the need for us to make food more nutritious, because for many people, their incomes have been significantly reduced. And less income 
means a much less diverse diet, and that is um, coupled with being less nutritious normally. So we really need to transform food systems so that we get nutrient rich staple foods that are, have to meet three criteria. They need to be available, they need to be accessible, affordable and desirable for all. So of course I need to uh, talk to you a little bit about golden rice and to those of you who've heard all of this before, I apologize, but it is worth just uh, telling you that what we've done with golden rice is added in just two genes um, and they're listed on the bottom part of that slide, phytoene synthase from maize and phytoene desaturase from a common soil microorganism. So those were the two genes that were linked into a construct that was introduced into rice via the agrobacterium that um, Dr. Olgameter was talking about. So what this does, these two enzymes um, give the rice grains the capacity then to finish um, a particular biochemical pathway, which leads to carotenoids being produced in the grain. And one of those carotenoids, the major form of them is beta carotene. And what happens is that as we consume that, beta carotene is converted into vitamin A um, in the body as it's required. So it's an incredibly safe way of um, improving vitamin A status in populations that are deficient. And as noted there, our research indicates, and we haven't done feeding studies yet on golden rice because we've been working on getting all of the regulatory approvals, but if people simply replace um, their rice consumption with golden rice, then our, all of our calculations indicate we can provide 30 to 50% of the estimated average requirement, which is a measure of how much is needed in a particular population. So, um, I seem to have my notes out of order here, but anyway, I do apologize for that. Oh dear. Just a little bit about, then about the estimated average requirement. It's the level at which the nutritional needs of half the population are met. So it's actually a measure of what's required. Um, and so I think the important thing here is to focus over here on the right-hand side of the screen that shows that the population may well sit here where most people have enough of the element to be sufficient for it, but there's this tail of the population that is at risk, okay? So if we can provide, even if we don't provide all that's required, if we can provide a proportion of what's required, we shift that whole distribution to the right and we have the potential to bring millions of people um, into sufficiency for that particular trait. So, um, our methodology for calculating this, I'm not going to go through this in detail, um, but this just goes you through the steps in the process as we move from milled rice. Um, and of course, there's some losses that occur across the storage uh, of milled rice. Um, we measure what proportion are useful. We know how much is lost in, co in cooking. And we also calculate how efficiently and effectively it's converted to vitamin A in the body. And that's how we do base all of our calculations for this. So that's a worked example there. And again, that simply shows that, um, that with all of our calculations, we can meet between 30 to 50%. So in this particular calculation, you can see on the right-hand side that we calculate we can meet 42% of the estimated average requirement for children one to three years old. And it's incredibly important that children get um, uh, adequate nutrition for their developmental um, purposes. So vitamin A is critical to, um, uh, to proper functioning of the immune system. And even at subclinical levels, um, um, it can have an impact on how long it takes to recover from a disease. So here we are with golden rice status, status sorry. And as uh, Dr. Aldameda indicated, we are so pleased that we've finally achieved full regulatory approval for golden rice in the Philippines. And it has been a relatively lengthy process. So the key, in, the key uh, messages here are that the yield and the agronomic characteristics are exactly the same 
for golden rice as for its parent variety and it, we can meet our nutritional goals. Golden rice though is not just one variety. It's a number, of, it can be bred into any number of varieties. And I would argue that it's really critical that we maintain a good relationship with um, the breeding programs that operate not only at IRI in the Philippines, but also um, uh, in our, within our national partners as well, so that we can actually introduce the golden rice trait or any other biotech trait into the absolutely best backgrounds that are available. And that's going to be critical in, in the future. The management in terms of um, farmers when they grow golden rice will be exactly the same as it is for existing varieties. There's no need for more fertilizer. They don't need to do anything differently. And in fact, you wouldn't be able to tell driving past the crop whether it's golden rice or not. The only thing that we require of farmers is that they deal with it carefully after harvest, just to ensure that it maintains its integrity um, so that it doesn't get mixed with other grains and so that it can actually meet the nutritional requirements. Um, and so down the bottom of the slide here, we just talk about the, um, uh, that the price will remain the same. That's really important because our focus is on those who, who can't afford a healthy diet. Um, and then uh, if we simply replace uh, what people are normally eating with golden rice, then um, we can meet those nutritional requirements. So I mentioned to you right at the outset that we've also got high iron and zinc rice waiting in the wings. And this is also another critical um, intervention, a new innovation that we can bring with biotech. We can do some things with conventional breeding to improve um, the zinc status in particular. Iron status, not so much, because most of the iron is held in the, um, in the, the bran layer that surrounds the rice grain, and that's effectively removed um, when rice is milled. But we've found a transgenic way of introducing some new genes, some ferritin genes that can actually in increase the amount of iron in the white rice grains after it's been milled. And so this is just an indication of uh, the first publication uh, of the biofortified high iron and zinc rice um, meeting its nutritional goals. And so we're working hard to achieve regulatory approval for high iron and zinc rice as well. So in terms of our future plans um, for healthier rice, well, um, I think the need is certainly still there. We hear occasionally, and certainly from our opponents, that the need is no longer there, so let's not worry about golden rice. And yet, sadly, I think that the current pandemic really highlights the need uh, for us to improve um, food nutritional quali uh, quality. Um, and I think the, the, the need is there actually in quite a number of, of countries. And so we have an opportunity wherever a significant um, amount of rice is consumed. Um, and obviously, in order to be successful with this, we need to have a country in which there's a functioning regulatory system. Because it's really important when we're dealing with these fundamental changes that we um, abide by the rules and regulations that have been set down to ensure safety. Um, and so I believe that that's a really important thing to do, not because I think anything is inherently unsafe, but because I respect the right of people to know what's in their food and for us to have done all to have met all of our regulatory obligations to demonstrate safety of the food. Now, I think what the future holds for us, though, is to build in not only added nutrition, but also farmer friendly traits. Um, and I'll show you a couple of those. Dr. Aldemita already talked about this a little bit, but one of the suggestions that I have is that we should be um, combining improved nutrition with nitrogen and water use efficiency and perhaps salt tolerance as well. So things that give the, the crop um, an ability to withstand uh, environmental stresses, uh, also disease or to use nutrients more effectively. So I think that's one uh, potential. So in moving through to, uh, to finish up what I'm saying, now this is a very dense slide, um, but the critical issue here is, as I mentioned before, biotech is a wonderful innovation. It gives us the opportunity to 
in a very precise manner change specific genes or a few genes um, by either introducing them or with gene editing, we can either up or down regulate genes. Um, and so I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities there, but these all must be built on the best varieties that are emanating from breeding programs. Now breeding programs assemble all of the genes that are required for success in a particular environment. And so that's complex, right? There are many thousands of possible combinations and I think conventional breeding remains critical and that, that um, our biotech innovations need to be built as, as decorations, if you will, additional benefits that can be married to existing um, varieties. And so here in this slide, I guess the, the bottom line is I'm emphasizing the importance of, of classical um, plant breeding, conventional plant breeding, so that we can build out advantages uh, onto those. And I'm arguing that we need constant support for those programs as well. I lived through a time in Australia where there was a huge swing uh, towards uh, biotech as being the answer for everything. Um, and that actually diverted resources away from our conventional program. And I would argue that's not the way to go. I believe we need to support both simultaneously, but ensure that there's really tight and effective linkages between the two so that the breeders will talk to the folks who can do the biotech innovations and we work in concert to produce um, important innovations to feed an increasing world population. I finish with this slide, which is my absolute favorite slide of all time. And that's to um, remind us of the reasons that we're undertaking this research, um, which is to, to um, improve the nutritional outcomes and get happy and healthy children. So one from the Philippines here and one from Bangladesh, but that applies equally to every country for which improved nutrition is required. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Renke. Um, it, it's a really very uh, inspiring and we're so happy of the progress made of Golden Rice. And I think many of our uh, participants now are very excited when it will hit the, um, the market. Here, I will yeah. lump the questions. So, because these are all related when they get to be commercialized. So here is a question yeah. from LPG Magowan. So it's about what is the effect of golden rice to the regular white rice sold in the market? Is there yeah. any effect in terms of prices? And mm -hmm. then um, the other one is my daughter's friend who sells rice is asking what name or brand is golden, golden rice to be sold and when? Mm -hmm. So okay. okay. So they're, look, they're both excellent questions. Um, the critical issue here is that whilst we've made a change to the, to the rice variety into which we put golden rice, there's absolutely no change to the way that it grows or the yield that it produces. And so one of our guiding principles with the project is to make sure that it goes to the marketplace with no increase in price. Um, now, I doubt that you will see golden rice on sale for less than ordinary rice, because that also mm -hmm. has big implications for the way people regard golden rice. So our aim is always to have it on sale at exactly the same price and into backgrounds, into varieties that people are familiar with and that they really like to eat. Um, now, what was the other question? Uh, well, brand names, that's right. Now, yes. that's a work in progress because what we've found now with, uh, within the Philippines is that where we've put golden rice into a, a known variety that's been through the variety registration process, then um, they've given us the opportunity to register that variety in a very um, effective and efficient manner by providing all of the data that we've generated on this variety. And they've said, if we've seen it already, and it's a known and established variety, then we can give you variety registration for the golden rice version of that variety. And I think that's likely to feature in the way we actually market the product. So it's likely that it will come in the background 
of people's favorite varieties, but perhaps mm -hmm. with a golden rice, um, uh, you know, uh, suffix on the end. So, so that that de defines it. I mean, obviously when you're going to see the rice, you'll immediately know that it's golden rice anyway. Okay. So I see yeah. that another question there is about whether it's hybrid or inbred. Or inbred. And yep. It's definitely going to be in inbred varieties because we want people, and it goes into the normal seed system that are that's available in the Philippines. All right, so there's no differences there. It will just be available to farmers in the normal way. And we definitely wanted it to be in inbred varieties so that um, so that farmers can choose to keep the seed if they want. So there's, there's no uh, means of any uh, company or organisation making sort of unwarranted profits from golden rice because it's available the same way uh, that all other inbred varieties are available. Here in the Q&A, Dr. Renki, our friend from Thailand is asking, how much and how often of golden rice need to be consumed per head from Nippon Ayam Sopasi? Yeah, sure. So we're hoping that um, that folks will simply replace their normal rice consumption with golden rice. And if they do that, they will get that 30 to 50 percent of the estimated average requirement, which is enough to move entire populations um, or demographic groups within populations to sufficiency for that particular trait. But of course, people are perhaps not going to do that automatically. So so um, the ideal would be if, uh, if they replace their normal rice consumption with golden rice, but if they simply replace half of their consumption with golden rice, then they'll still derive a significant benefit from it. Um, but, uh, but obviously the best, the best option for them is to replace all of their uh, normal consumption. They don't have to eat any more, but neither should they eat less rice. Okay, and here's the last question to be answered, Dr. Renki, from Miss mm. Maria Lorelli Agbagala. How do mm. you see the public acceptance of golden rice, especially the farmers, consumers, as mm. compared to conventional rice? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And to be honest, it's a bit of an unknown at the moment. But what we recognise is that that is a really significant part of our, our next steps in deployment are uh, to ensure that consumers are aware of what it is. They have to know the health benefits um, uh, of what it is. And um, so we need to make all of that information available to them. And we need to be very clear that it looks different. And it looks different when it's cooked as well. Now, in the Philippines, I know there was a... Um, there was a, uh, an intervention some time ago where people used to actually mix some, some what I would call margarine or margarine with the rice <laughs> to make it yellow, right? And it so it's not, it's not an unknown thing to have rice that is that yellow in colour, okay? So, but I think that, um, I'm not sure if this is a good answer to your question, but we recognise how important that is. And we have to have an in, entire communications and uh, stakeholder engagement and advocacy campaign to ensure people know what it looks like, what to expect. The last thing I would say is that we had a great event with the uh, Secretary of Agriculture who opened a new biotech centre at Phil Rice just recently, and they had a ceremonial tasting of golden rice. And the, um, the, the overwhelming response of all of the dignitaries that tasted it was they said it tastes just the same as ordinary rice, but all of them, and I guess you'd expect this, but all of them said, I would eat golden rice in preference to other rice because of the health benefits that it brings. Thank you so much, Dr. Renke. We have five more questions here. If you can stay a little bit more yeah. to answer, type your questions, uh, your sure. answers to these questions. Thank sure. you so much, Dr. Renke. happy to do Let's that. Thank a you. A round of applause for Dr. Renke. <laughs> okay, so we move on to our uh, next speaker, last but not the least speaker, and I would like to introduce our last speaker who is a Hungarian national and completed his PhD in molecular plant breeding from Corvinus University in Budapest. In 2004, he joined the Hungarian Seed Association as professional assistant, and in 
2006, he was appointed to the position of Secretary General. He is currently the Regulatory Affairs Manager of International Seed Federation. Today, he will talk about new plant breeding innovations. Let us all welcome and listen to Dr. Salvox Ruthner, or Sabi, as you can see from his screen. Sabi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sunny. Thank you very much for the for the kind um, introduction, and um, thank you very much for for the invitation to this uh, very important uh, event. Um, I think a little bit shifting topics uh, compared to the spe previous speakers because I will speak about um, uh, plant breeding and innovation and and more about um, um, genome editing, uh, which is um, mostly known. Um, by 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 everybody today. So I haven't made really specific slides on on how um, uh, genome editing works because I think there are there are numerous uh, videos and and educational tools um, which uh, deals with this topic. But uh, potentially because in the previous presentation we spoke about the. Uh, um, um, GMOs. So basically, the biggest difference in genome editing that most of the application and most of the application used today uh, by by plant breeders and, and plant scientists are are working within uh, the, the 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 species own gene pool without the introduction of of transgene. Um, before I, I speak uh, about the presentation, just a few words about International Seed Federation for those. Uh, who don't uh, uh, know our organization. So we are uh, the voice of the international seed sector. Uh, we have uh, a seed, national seed associations uh, members. Uh, we have currently uh, 58 national seed associations who are members of ISF. And we are in present in 75 countries and, and uh, directly or via the national seed association, we are representing more than uh, 7,000 companies. Um, this presentation, it's a short time frame, and I need to cover um, uh, quite a bit. So I, I will give you a kind of high level overview that uh, what is plant breeding innovation and why it's important, um, why we need uh, enabling and supporting and, and globally aligned policies. And in the, in the last part of, of the presentation, I will show you some some trends in research and developments and, and about some products which are already on the market. So when we are speaking about plant breeding innovation and, and genome editing, we, we always want to speak about uh, as a continuum of all the knowledge as, uh, as plant scientists and breeders are accumulated in the past. So um, this is part of the, the plant breeding activity. This is part of uh, um, the, the toolbox what plant breeders are using. And the main aim is, the, what is the plant breeder's aim? Uh, it's to increase and create uh, genetic variability when they can use to, to, to develop new characteristics. So I think the main takeaway message, and this is a good slide, uh, it shows that, um, um, with this um, induced uh, genetic variation, what we create either by random mutation, either by gene editing or introducing a transgene, this is part of, of the breeding cycle, the, uh, the, the, the everyday work of the breeding. So even if genome editing exists um, and it will be used in the past, it won't make um, earlier method obsolete. So like crossing and selection will be still part of the plant breeders daily work. This is just uh, help us to, to do it more precisely, more efficiently and create more genetic variation. I think when we are thinking about uh, this uh, thing, we, we need to look at this kind of comprehensive way and we shouldn't single out any uh, application uh, from, from, from this uh, comprehensive view. Um, and also, this is the segue to, 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 to the policy. So um, the utilization of any kind of technologies, it's, it's pretty much depend on uh, the policies and the regulation uh, uh, surrounding the, the technology. And I think it's, uh, we have uh, past uh, examples that uh, 
if uh, uh, an area is overregulated, it's it put a significant burden on the usage of 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 any kind of technology. And usually, what happens only those companies and those stakeholders can can use uh, those technologies, which have uh, more uh, financial means. So it means the largest companies, and also it could be only utilized in in the highest value crop and the highest value trades. Um, and I will show you some example that is, is absolutely not the case today with, with genome editing. So basically, one of our, our biggest uh, aim as, as the international seed sector, as, as the representative ISF, is to, to make sure that we have uh, a science-based and um, consistent policies uh, across, across the countries, which are, are pretty much uh, facilitate innovation and, and collaboration and these are because uh, seed is an uh, internationally traded good. These policies need to be consistent across uh, countries and, and economies. So um, there are three factors which are affecting how a policy is, is predictable uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the industry, for the seed sector. So first of all, there needs to be common criteria and agreement to determine the scope of the regulatory oversight or which products will fall under uh, to the GM regulations or biotech regulation and which uh, products uh, uh, will be considered as, as conventional. I think this is scope. Uh, we know that there will be different uh, regulatory tools, how the countries based on their their uh, their tradition use of, of biotech product will will look at it and there will be different type of regulatory framework but the scope uh, needs to be uh, pretty much aligned and there needs to be some alignment on the implementation of the criteria and also the type of information that uh, regulators ask from the developers because uh, if it's too prescriptive it's it's too much details it could look at as a kind of risk assessment type of uh, information exchange because which can also hinder uh, uh, developers and, and make uh, and this uh, a bigger financial and administrative burden. Um, so I don't want to go to the details, but I think that the, the basic principle what the, uh, what the industry and the, the plant breeding sector is argue is that if a plant variety is uh, developed through the, uh, the latest plant breeding methods, uh, such as genome editing, shouldn't be differently regulated if uh, the outcome, if the product or the variety is similar or in indistinguishable varieties that could have been produced through earlier breeding methods, including uh, random mutagenesis, for instance, or it can be found from on, of, of nature, found in the nature. And uh, I think it's it's lands pretty practical and, and reasonable. And uh, and luckily, uh, many, many countries are are following uh, this this footstep. So this is a, a map. I, again, I don't have time to to explain in detail what's happening in every country. I think from the what is the takeaway from here that those countries who are in in dark uh, uh, green, uh, these countries have have supporting uh, um, uh, legislative framework uh, which uh, exempt uh, uh, some of the product. Uh, from the GM tech, uh, regulation and, and considered uh, as as um, as conventional product, the way is different because there are some product based approach, there are some process based approach, but what is important here that it's already some uh, good uh, examples existing, uh, which makes uh, genome edited products and varieties uh, 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 easily accessible. Uh, for for research and also for uh, for for product launch, I think for this uh, uh, and I think this is a timely discussion here uh, today because especially in the South East uh, Asian region, there are countries who are uh, started developing their policy framework. So uh, Philippines, I think there is a very good um, um, development. So they have a. a, a a guidance, a draft guidance, uh, which is very much following the principles I just mentioned. In Thailand, the discussion uh, just just started. Uh, also, in 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 Singapore, there was a draft guideline on the on the food and feed import aspects of of generated products. So, 
uh, things are started to, to happening uh, in the southeastern region. So that's why I think it's it's important to to speak about uh, uh, genome editing as well, beside the, the classical uh, biotech products. Um, some examples, um, what it's uh, it's either in research and uh, or or the basic the last two product, the high oleic acid soybean and the high GABA tomato, it's already on the market. I think in the the tomorrow there will be a presentation from from Dr. Azura, uh, who is one of the developer behind the the high GABA tomato. Um, these are just examples, basically, to illustrate the the, the wide range of crops and and the wide range of of, um, of potential benefits that these crops uh, can can bring uh, either to the agriculture because it's a uh, it will be some agronomic value behind or directly can translate to the consumers because it improves the nutritional value, the nutritional component of the product. Um, as we know, it's a it's it's a it's a, it's a highly um, um, researched and and uh, uh, area. If we, if you see just uh, the few of the the uh, the most crops where uh, genome editing application uh, used uh, for, uh, both uh, research purposes, um, uh, as you see, it's it's rice is, is leading. Of course, it's not by a chance because rice is one of the model crop for for genome editing, but it's, it's, it shows the, the amount of, uh, of work uh, by researchers put in, in, into this area in the recent three years. And this is relatively a, a, a new technology. So it has a five, six years uh, history in terms of uh, the CRISPR uh, invention and usage of, of, of in, in plant research. So we can say that it's a, there's a high interest in them, especially from from the public uh, institution. If you a little bit zoom into the, the market-oriented application, which are the ones which uh, can have in the future some, some um, products which uh, can hit the market, I think what is the takeaway message here, against the, the diversity, the diversity of the crops uh, where research has been done, and also the diversity of the different type of application, the different type of characteristics that uh, genome editing can improve. So it can be agronomic value, food and feed quality, biotic and abiotic stress, herbicide tolerance, under, uh, and also other, um, other improvement in, in industrial use. So uh, this is really democratizing the research uh, in terms of, of, of the crop. So it's not just a high value crop, but uh, uh, a little bit help to uh, close the gap on those underutilized crop, which uh, hasn't been uh, put so much breeding efforts in, in, in the past, but because the accessibility and, and relatively uh, cheap nature of this technology make it more um, uh, applicable and accessible for, for these type of crops as well. The other Diversity, what we see, this is an um, uh, example from, from Argentina, where there is a, one of the oldest uh, regulatory framework for genome editing, and there are concrete products are going through the pipeline. It's also the diversity uh, in, in the developers. So it's a lot of local, small and medium-sized companies, a lot of uh, public researchers uh, who are behind those products, and only a small section is... Uh, if if is for for multinational companies, so I think one of the biggest message here is is the potential what this genome editing application can bring to to research the the diversity in crops, the diversity in in the in the potential applications, and also the diversity of the developers. And and here is some some watch outs that uh, what could why is important to have this kind of. Uh, enabling policies which are science-based, risk-based, and, and consistent across uh, the countries, because uh, we will have a similar um, um, patchway of, of regulation, what we experience today with GMOs, we can have uh, relatively the same outcome or a similar outcome that uh, the, uh, the access will be restricted and also uh, the crops where uh, this uh, uh, genome editing application will use also uh, be limited. So 
and as a consequence, uh, uh, all the research cooperation, all this hype we, we see uh, nowadays are genotyping will be put at risk. And in the end, uh, the increasing predictability and sustainability, what we all aim for uh, working for agriculture will be, will be more challenges and we, we obviously would like to, to avoid uh, this scenario. So as a concluding slides, uh, latest breeding methods provide opportunities to target global challenges as well as local needs and can help us achieve sustainable agriculture production and, and food security. So again, the potential is there, but the, the further uh, utilization will depends on the regulatory frameworks, uh, what will uh, be uh, uh, implemented in the different countries in the future. We see uh, good alignment and positive trends and, and we, we work for that this field uh, even more in the countries which are, uh, there is a question mark behind at the moment. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabi, for this very informative presentation on gene editing. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, this is live streamed through Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I'm, well, here is a question around the, the research part that you have, that you talk about in one of your slides. So the academic community has active R&D in genome editing. Please share your thoughts, how the academic community can help in a way that its research in genome editing will bear fruit and be used by farmers and consumers. Yeah, I, I think what is the, 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 the most important thing is um, that different countries are, are using different models. So I think uh, tomorrow, it's a good example from, from Dr. Azura, then the, the, the breeding and the, the basic research started at the university level. And, uh, and in Japanese, uh, this model, and uh, Japan, this model has worked very well that uh, basically creating a spin-off company, which is focusing on the development uh, and putting some, some private investment in it can, can yield the product. So I think there is no uh, one size fit all kind of solution. Different, different countries have a different uh, uh, ways to work together uh, with, with the private sector. So I think uh, through a private and public partnership, uh, 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 this research which, which puts um, into this uh, area by, by the public institute can, can yield uh, uh, really uh, uh, a good product. So um, I think there are, what we see again, it's going back to the diversity. So many new startup companies are, are coming out either from this, from this uh, incubator of, of the public research area. So, so it depends on the products and depends on the countries, but there are multiple way of, of cooperating uh, either just uh, solely by the public sector or having this kind of bridges between the, the private and the public sector as well. Thank you very much. Here's another question. And uh, because of time constraint, it will, this will be our last question. This is from Dr. Nippon. I am Supasi from Thailand. What is your opinion on SDN2 gene editing? should be regulated as GM crops or should not be regulated? I think I'm an easy, easy um, um, for me to, to answer this question because as ISF, as the international seed sector has, uh, has basically adopted a, a position uh, which, which established uh, three key areas where we think uh, a product shouldn't be um, regulated as, 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 as a GM. So we believe because since uh, this is something uh, which still works in the, in the gene pool and the own gene pool uh, of, of the plan and it doesn't introduce a whole genetic construct with, with promoter, terminator and, and structure gene, but making uh, um, 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 another few, but maybe a, even a, a few hundred base per changes, but it doesn't means the same if you introduce a transgene with all of the, the regulatory elements of, of the gene. So uh, as our 
uh, view on it. Uh, an SD and two type of uh, uh, genome edited products are not shouldn't be considered uh, as as GMOs. And uh, in many countries, this is uh, today the case. Thank you. I will make an exception to my rule. <laughs> Sorry. Just one more question. This is from Maricel Adelantar. The question is, is gen genome editing feasible to local farmers? Is that possible that rural farmers could avail the privilege of having these types of biotech products? I think this is a good question. And that's why I, I really um, said that this, um, this application, these methods uh, could be used in, uh, for instance, underutilized crops, but also to improve local varieties we know that in in local farmers they are they are really much uh, want to use those locally adapted varieties which is which is uh, they have the tradition to use uh, with the attached to it the good thing is with genome editing that you can improve this these local varieties just by adding a new resistance and just by uh, making it more uh, tolerant to to heat or or drought without uh, basically uh, touching all the other characteristics of of uh, of, of the crop, what uh, the, the the farmers locally like and and they're looking for. So and also because of the relatively um, cheap nature of of the technology. So uh, and if this this will be the same and won't be like a very big regulatory burden on this. I think this this is the the, the perfect example, the potential uh, these technologies can bring to. Uh, underutilized crops and also uh, uh, varieties, local varieties, uh, which can be improved uh, that way. Okay, so Maricel, if the public policy is just right, then the answer is yes. We will have farmers will have access to that. I understand, Sabi. You have a we have you you prepared a poll question. So let's have this interaction with our. Participants, we're going to show you a, a poll question prepared by Savi, and please try to answer that. Uh, these poll questions, and we listen to what our participants are thinking. We have 232 of them. So, um, Bowie, our technical manager, could you show the poll questions? There are two. Okay. Do you agree? that plants develop using genome editing with changes that could have been obtained by traditional breeding or found in nature shouldn't be regulated as GMOs. That's the number one. You choose only one answer. The second question, currently there's no international regulatory framework for genome editing. Do you agree that value chain stakeholders and their organization Academia, breeders, farmers, traders have a role in advocating policy alignment among countries. And here's the last question. Who do you think will be the biggest beneficiaries of product developed by the latest breeding methods? Okay, so let's have, uh, okay, so if everyone, what, question one, question three, okay, let's see. So who are the biggest beneficiaries here? Okay. All right, so I forgot my alarm. So it must be one more minute. Okay. I just I just recognize that panelists cannot vote. I, I don't know whether, whether I agree with this or not. <laughs> Okay, so here are, so um, let me see one more minute. Let's, let's give one minute because there are three questions. All right, I'm sorry, I'm rolling it. So the third question, who do you think will be the biggest beneficiaries of product? So you have four of that. Uh, okay, and then there's, mm -hmm, I go back to one. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see. It doesn't have to be all perfectly answered. So uh, Bowie, are we ready to show the results of this uh, mini survey? What are our participants thinking? 
Okay, so I'll count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oops. <laughs> okay. Let me see if we can show. Thank you so much, Sabi, for you know, taking the time. It's what, what time is it in the morning there in Switzerland? It's not too bad. It's almost 9 a.m. So. Okay. So you have to wake up early. <laughs> All right. Okay. So in terms of, this is very uh, education, informative. Sabi, you, do you agree that plants develop using genome editing with changes that could have been obtained by traditional breeding or found in nature shouldn't be regulated as GMO? So 39% agree, but is closely followed by strongly agree. So if we put that together, it's more than 50%, that's 69%. On question number two, Sabi, currently there's no international regulatory framework for genome editing. Do you agree that value chain stakeholders and their organization, academia breeders, have a role in advocating policy? So everyone, majority, agree, uh, Sabi. Very nice. And the last question, who do you think will be the biggest beneficiaries of product developed by the latest breeding methods? Farmers, on everybody, just put a here 30 okay so thank you so much everyone all participants thank you so much now we close the poll and we'd like to thank sabi with a round of applause <laughs> sabi thank you so we move on to the last part of our uh, program we now go to uh, this is important because we're giving away $20 shopping voucher. <laughs> shopping voucher. So the mechanics are simple. We will show one question and you have to type the answer on the chat box on your screen and click enter. The first three persons to get the correct answer wins. Okay. Uh, Bowie, I hope you're ready. Are you ready? Is everyone ready? Okay, maybe we should do a countdown. So we will show the question. I'll count five and we will show it when I finish counting. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, here's the question. In crop improvement, plant breeders continue to develop methods to safely increase precision and efficiency of breeding. In today's topic, we talk about the following except genetic engineering, gene editing, conventional tillage, GM crops, corn, soybeans, cotton, golden rice. Okay, where is my team Bowie and our team? So I think so many, we received so many answers already. Do we have the three? Winners, wait, wait a minute. I see all of them having the correct answer, maybe. <laughs> Are you copying? Okay, so we'll see. It, there's no appeal to the announcement. So our staff uh, who receives this, okay, so who? Oh, okay. <laughs> They are, uh, these are the winners of our $20 question. You will receive a, uh, what do you say? A shopping voucher. Okay, Aldrin John Alviar, Angelo Tandang, and Sol Moldi. So with that, for the winners, congratulations. We will get in touch with you through email and how to claim your prizes. Once again, I am Sonita Baba of Crop Life Asia, your moderator for today. See you again tomorrow, same time, same link. And thank you all for attending the first day of our 15th Pan Asia Farmers Exchange Program. And, uh, okay. Okay, so thank you everyone. See you tomorrow.